There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God is good? You always hesitate briefly before you answer. God is good? And all the time. And this is a fact. It's a, it's a hard and fast fact. God is good. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. Now because of our finite minds, we may not always understand or even detect the goodness of God to us. But God is always good. That's a biblical fact and also my personal testimony. Psalm 100 verse 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his work. Psalm 145, verse 17. So I thank God for being a good God, a generous God, a forgiving God, a patient God, a long-suffering God, a God who says, I will forgive and forget. Mm. We say we forgive, but we absolutely do not forget. God forgives, and he says, and their sins and iniquities shall I remember no more. Another symbol he uses, I will cast their sins into the depth of the sea. And the sea is so deep that if you put Mount Everest in the deepest part of the ocean, the water will still rise above it about a mile. The sea is so deep, and God is trying to teach us, I will cast your sins so far from me, I will not even remember them. It's nice to see you. It is three minutes after three. I'll release you by 3.45. Today is Wednesday, as we call it, hump day. The middle of the week, God has brought us from Sunday, well, from Sabbath to today, and we firmly believe the same God who brought us this far will take us further. Our subject for today, in his image. What did I say? In his image, as always, please make sure that there's no source of disturbance in the house of God because the creator of heaven and earth, the God of the universe is among us in the person of his spirit and we want to show proper respect for him. Sometimes God doesn't bless us because we don't respect him. And we wonder, why doesn't God bless me? Well, any time God seems not to be blessing, let's do a self-examination of us, not of God, of us. And you'll always find the fault lies with me, never with God. That's why David did not pray, search yourself. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way. Everlasting Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I speak. Jeremiah 1, verse 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And truly and sincerely, I want to speak God's words. And favor number three, think, think, think. Isaiah 118, tell me what that says, the first part of that verse. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Yes, we serve a reasonable God. And I told you, I believe the first or second evening we met, Satan is unreasonable, but God is reasonable. He really, really is. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we come to you. In your word, you've described yourself as abundant in goodness and truth, long-suffering, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. You covered the whole gamut of wrongdoing. We're grateful for that, Father. And having said that, if we've sinned against you, forgive us, Father. Whether we sin by commission or omission, thought, word, or deed, cleanse us in the blood of your Son, which is his life. I ask you to impart to me liberally your Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth. Let him direct my thinking, my speaking, my behavior, my everything, that not only what I say will glorify you, but how I conduct myself. Bless those listening. Teach them the word, Father. If anyone is on his or her way, 
bring that person safely. And for those who will listen to the message when it is broadcast, bless them with light, bless them with life, bless them with salvation. Heal the sick, I pray, particularly those with COVID-19 or any of its variants. Heal them, Father, as an act of raw mercy. Heal them, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our subject, in his image. We will do some review of some things I've said in the past meetings that we have attended. One, let's look at Jesus Christ. We look at Christ. Let us go to John chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. We're looking at the man called Christ, who is also God. John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. The passage I'm about to read is very, very familiar. John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Question for you, who is that word? Jesus Christ. Studying verse from verse, you look at verse 14. What does verse 14 say? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so when we read verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we have the word is equal with the Father. That's what is meant by was God. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. What does verse 3 tell us about the word? He's the creator. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So we have the sentiment of verse 3 repeated in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. I want you to observe, go back to verse 1 and verse 2 of John 1 as we continue. In his image, we're taking a brief look at Christ. In the beginning was the Word, that's one person. And the Word was with God, that's two persons. And the Word was God, that's equality. We have plurality and equality. Plurality, more than one. Equality, same nature. Verse 2 says, the same, that's the word, was in the beginning with God. We have the two again. Verse 3 says, all things were made by him, not them, even though we have two. Did I say that clumsily? Let me say it again. Verse 1 introduces two beings, the word and God. Verse 2 repeats the same which is the word, was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, one of them created. All things were made by him. Who is this him? Because we have two. Verse 10 tells us, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So the Bible is the best expositor, explainer of what it means. Jesus Christ is presented over and over as the creator. But let me say quickly, he functioned as the agent of the Father. Let's go see that in Ephesians chapter 3. We read verse 10. Our subject, in his image. Ephesians chapter 3, we read verse 10. That verse will show us, then we'll go to other evidence that Jesus Christ functioned as the agent of the Father. So the Father can also claim to have created, but he did it through Christ. Do you have Ephesians 3 verse 10? Yes. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Let's read 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, finish that verse, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Our target verse is 9. He created all things how? By Jesus Christ. Now, go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. We read from verse 1. Do we have Hebrews 1? Not yet. Reading from verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, finish that verse for me, by whom also he made the world. And so Christ created for the Father's will, the Father's pleasure, 
Christ is the creator, but function as the agent of the Father. He is also the agent of the Father in salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Christ is an agent of the Father in salvation, and in, or let me reverse the order, in creation and in salvation, which is a spiritual form of creation now. So we know the person who created Adam was Christ. Let us go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, we'll read verses 4 and 5. 1 John towards the back of the Bible. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Are we there? Amen. Read with me. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Why? For sin is the transgression of the law. Now read 5 very carefully. And ye know that he was manifested to do what? Take away our sin. Finish the verse. And in him what? Is no sin. By the way, let me digress and add to what I said last night. Look at verse 5 again. I'll read it as you watch it. And ye know... That he, who is he? Christ. Was manifested, he came, to do what? Take away our sin. Keep reading. And in him is no sin. Now if you add that to verse 4. Verse 4 has something in it. That's the law. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. So we have the law and sin in verse 4. Do you see that? Nobody answered the preacher. You see it. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. So we have two realities in verse 4. Sin and law. Now, read verse 5 and tell me what Christ came to take away. What did he come to take away? Sin. So what did he leave? The law. He did not come to take away the law, as most preachers tell you. The law has been done. He came to take away sin because the problem has never been the law. The problem has been our sinful condition. And so he came to take away the problem. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19 verse 7. You don't get rid of something perfect. You get rid of something imperfect. So he, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, but he left the law. You can't take away God's law. All right. And so we've seen that the creator is Christ. We've also seen in him is no sin. All right. Now, let's go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. We read verse 26 of Genesis 1. Father in heaven, continue to speak through me very clearly, plainly, and powerfully for your glory and the blessing of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Stop. Read that verse differently based on what I've been saying. Who's the creator? Christ. Read that verse again. Christ. And Christ said, mm -hmm, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, what did we discover about Christ in addition to the fact that he's creator? He's without sin. He's without sin. All right, good. Now listen to him. Let us make man how? Without sin. Without sin. In our image. Adam and Eve were made sinless. The purpose of the gospel is to restore what was lost because of sin. Say that differently for me. The purpose of the gospel is to restore what? Sinlessness. Not to provide excuses to sin. The purpose of the gospel is to restore what was lost because God does not change his standards. 
When Adam sinned, he broke the law because sin is a transgression of the law. God was confronted with his law, violated, now we have sin. He could have lowered the law or removed the law and so sin would cease to be a problem. Or he could leave the law where it was, which he did, and provide a solution to deal with this thing called sin. What did he do? He left the law intact because the law expresses his character and he provided a solution to deal with the problem of sin. That solution we call the gospel embodied in Jesus Christ himself. Let's do some more reasoning as we continue in his image. Adam was made perfect. Then Adam sinned. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Romans tells us, Therefore, as by the offense of one, the offense, not the offenses, the offense, one mistake. Adam committed one sin that's recorded in Eden. What did God do? What did God do? Yes, he put him out of Eden for one sin. Now follow me closely, one sin. Adam and Eve made aprons of leaves for themselves, Genesis 3, verse 8, uh, verse 7. In verse 21, God gave them apron, uh, coats of skin representing the covering of Christ. The covering of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, was made necessary because of one sin. Let me say it differently. If Adam had committed no more sins, Christ still would have come to die for that one sin. Because the moment Adam sinned, Christ became a savior, a mediator. I'm saying all that to say this, what God wants is sinlessness, not fewer sins. Yep. Did I say that clearly? Some Christians believe God wants us to commit fewer sins or smaller ones. When the woman came, let's go to John chapter 5. Let's go to John 5. Remember the man who had been sick 38 years at the pool of Bethesda? John 5. Jesus healed him. And the man got up, walked away. The Pharisees were upset because he was carrying his bed on the Sabbath. Anyway, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus did what? Findeth him the temple and said unto him, what? Behold, thou art made whole. Keep reading. Sin no more. Stop. What did Jesus mean by sin no more? Did he mean sinless? Commit, no, commit, did he mean sin, commit fewer sins? That's what I'm saying. Did he mean commit fewer sins? Did he mean commit smaller sins at greater intervals, one every six weeks? What did Jesus mean? He meant precisely what he said, go and sin no more. Three chapters later, chapter eight of the book of John. Now we go from a man to a woman. The woman taken in adultery. What did Jesus say to her? Neither do I condemn thee. Come on, tell me. Go and sin no more. What did Jesus mean? Don't sin. Don't sin. What's our subject? In his What's the image of Christ? Sin. Sinlessness. What I'm trying to tell you, hold on to your seats. God requires of us that our goal be sinlessness. And he has provided a way for this to be accomplished in us. Notice my words, not for us to do it, for it to be accomplished in us. No sinner can practice sinlessness in his or her own power. That requires divine power working in us as we remain surrendered to God. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Listen to what I said. Sinlessness is accomplished by the power of God working in us 
as we remain surrendered to him, and therein lies the battle. The battle is not the ability of God to cleanse us completely. The battle lies with our willingness to remain surrendered to God. Amen. Go to James chapter 1, the half-brother of Jesus. James, brother James, brother to John as Andrew is brother to Peter. James chapter 1, we'll read from verse 1. No, no, that's not the brother to John, sorry. That was the half-brother of Christ, not the brother to John. James chapter 1, reading from verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, broad greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers what? Or trials, knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be what? Perfect, perfect come on, and entire. and entire wanting. The word entire means whole, spiritually whole, that ye may be perfect and entire. Finish the verse, wanting nothing, no area where sin still has a place to lay its head. That she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We have to come to the place where we accept the biblical teaching, at least accept it. That sinlessness, sinless living is required of us by God. As long as we live in doubt, it will never be a reality for us. Because if we don't believe it, the prospect of it happening in our lives will never exist. We must believe that the Bible calls upon us to live flawless, blameless lives, but only through the abiding power of Christ as we remain surrendered to him. Let's look at the other half-brother of Jesus Christ, Jude. Let's go to the book of Jude. Jude has one chapter we read verse 24. Jude is just before Revelation, easy to find. The book of Jude, verse 24. Are you there? Amen. Read with me. What does that verse say? Now unto him that is able to do what? Keep you from falling. Let's pause right there. There's a word that's very, very significant. Can you guess that word? Okay, keep is good. Able. Mm -hmm. I think I heard someone say able. Now unto him that is what? Able. Then when you say a sinless life is impossible, you are throwing aspersions on the ability of God. Now unto him that is able to keep me from falling and to keep you. The ability lies with God. The willingness to have that life lies with us. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling. Go to uh, Ezekiel 36. Let's get some. Ezekiel 36. We read 26 and 27, particularly 27. Our subject, in his image. The book of Ezekiel, one of the major prophets. And by the way, you hear of major prophets and minor prophets. They are minor only because they have very few chapters, but not because their message is minor, simply because they have few chapters. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they have many chapters. That's why they're called major. But they're not major because their message is more important than those with a few chapters. You follow what I'm trying to say? Major, minor. All right. Ezekiel 36, reading from verse 26. Are you there? Yes. A new heart also will I give you. Who is giving it to us? Christ. Christ. But we must let him do that. Are you following me? The ability is Christ. The willingness is ours. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I do what? Put within you. And I will do what? Take away the stony heart of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Now read verse 27 for me. I will put my spirit within you. Come on. And will cause you to walk in my what? Statues. Mm -hmm. I will cause you to walk in my statues. What do you understand by walk in my statues? Give me one word. Obey. I 
will cause you the power to do it is the work of God in us. I, says God, will cause you to walk in my statutes. When God told Abraham he'd have a child, in chapter 17, Abraham laughed at God. Chapter 17, verse 17, I believe it is. In chapter 18, Sarah laughed. So the whole family laughed at God. The Bible says, actually, Abraham fell on his face. You know, you hear the expression is common today, LOL, <laughs> laughing out loud. Abraham fell down and laughed at God when God told him he'd have a child. Genesis 17. Chapter 18, Sarah fell down laughing. Now, having confronted laughter from husband and wife, God asks Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? I have a short temper, for example. I don't have one, but let's say I did. I have to ask myself the question, is it too hard for God to free me from that? The answer is no. I steal God's money, I don't return a tithe. Is God able to bring me to the place where I return what's his gladly? The answer is yes. I am tied to smoking. Does God have the power to deliver me from the chains of smoking or alcohol or pornography or gambling? The answer is yes. So our focus isn't look at how bad I am. The focus must be look at how powerful God is. Because as long as you and I look at how sinful we are, we'll be discouraged. Let's look at a Bible principle. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's a verse you know very well. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, our subject in his image. I'm trying to tell you from the Bible, God requires a sinless life. Nothing less than that will qualify a person for entrance into God's kingdom. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Do we have that? You may read with me. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, what is that verse telling us? There's, there's a statement we have derived from that verse. By beholding, come on, you know it. We become changed. Listen again. By beholding, we become changed. Now. That works negatively and positively. When the Israelites were bitten in the wilderness because they murmured against Moses and God, God and Moses, and God sent snakes, bit them. Moses prayed, God told Moses, make a serpent of bronze, put it on a pole, and tell them, look at the serpent, not at the bite. Look at the serpent. Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me, not unto your sinfulness. Look unto me. What I'm trying to say to you is this. By beholding, we become changed. If you continue to behold how sinful you are, it will, you, will, you will remain in that image. Because by beholding, we become changed. But if you look at Jesus and his power, that changes as well. By beholding, we become changed. We have to decide, will I look to Christ or I look at my sinfulness and spend all my life crying? Now to him that is able to keep you from falling. We read that in Jude 1 24. God can keep me from falling. We'll get to the method that he does that in a minute. Ezekiel 36, 27, and I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will be the power by which you obey. You cannot obey in your own power. It does not work. My brothers and sisters, what God requires of us, he provides the power for its accomplishment. But we must accept the Bible teaching that a sinless life is what God wants. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. The book of Romans, written by Paul, chapter 8. We'll read from verse 1. Verse 1. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What causes condemnation? Come on, it's a three-letter word. Sin. Now listen to the verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What do you understand by walk after the spirit? That's the life led by the spirit, led by the spirit. Not only on Sabbath, led by the spirit in church, in your business affairs, on the playground, in your family, recreationally, led by the spirit all the time by the spirit. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Sin no longer dominates my life. I am free from it. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, meaning we do not have to sin. Jesus demonstrated by taking our condition that we do not have to sin. It is not a must because Christ provides the power to live a life that pleases God. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We have that repeated. The key is to walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus Christ came to demonstrate that the high holy standards of God's perfect law can be expressed in us. I believe I told you, I think I did, when God made Adam, he made him from dust. Did I tell you that? I think I did. Dust. Now when God made Adam, there was gold available. The Genesis 2, verse 11 and 12, there was gold all around. And the gold of that land is good. There's delium and the onyx stone. There were precious stones all over. But God chose dust. And in dust, God put his sinless image. What's the lesson for us? That if we allow God to do what he desires to do, God can reproduce his character in us. This is the purpose of the gospel. To take us back to the way it was before Adam sinned. Too many Christians do not believe that. I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm talking about the work of God in the life of the surrendered person. And our problem is to stay surrendered. Go to John 14 with me. Well, let's look at that operating in the life of Christ. Our subject in his image. John 14. Let's read from verse 8. Are we there? Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Ye that have seen me have seen the Father. What is Jesus saying? He that have seen me have seen the Father. The character of the Father was produced in the life of Christ. And Christ is saying, when you observe me, whether I'm speaking or healing, whatever I'm doing, you are virtually looking at the Father in action because I reflect the Father. He that have seen me have seen the Father. Verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Now you finish that verse. The words, I speak unto you, come on. I speak not of myself. Come on, finish it. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. It was the Father working through Christ. Christ remaining submitted. And so Christ could say, he that have seen me, have seen. <laughs> what will amaze the universe, including angels, will be when God finally succeeds with our permission in reproducing his character in us. When Adam was made, that was amazing. 
But Adam did not have a carnal nature. Are you with me? He did not have a carnal nature. The gospel will produce the character of God in people who still possess the carnal nature, but are not led by the carnal nature. Are you following me? Let me say it again. When Adam was made, that was spectacular, but he was made sinless. We were not made sinless. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We we're born with a nature that hates God, and the gospel can change that person into, from a hater of God, from a hater of truth, from a hater of the law, to a lover of God, a lover of truth, a lover of the law, a reflector of the very character of God. And we have to believe that. And when that is done, God will finally able to be able to say, here is a group that has obeyed my law, reflected my character perfectly. In the Jewish system, you needed two witnesses to establish a truth. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. He says, she, 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 she said it did not work. You couldn't, you know, my word against yours, that didn't work. You had to have one or two witnesses. Now, Jesus Christ came, he kept the law perfectly. But he's only one witness. God needs how many more witnesses at least? He needs one more to make it two. One more. That one more has to be whom? The church. The church. Because the church is called, when God told Moses to go talk to Pharaoh, he said, let my son go, my firstborn son. The, the, all of Israel was called from time to time God's son, the whole nation, his son. So sometimes God views all his people as his son. So God had two sons. Jesus, he reflected the father's character perfectly. Now God has to do it in another son. That's the church. Then we will have two witnesses. And it will be established universally that the character of God can be perfectly reproduced in mankind born with a sinful nature, but led by the Spirit of God. That will be the miracle of the gospel. Amen. You don't need the Spirit of God to live a decent life. Most atheists, I believe, are decent. Hmm? Are you following me? You don't need the Spirit of God to live a decent life. When I say you don't need the Spirit, not as your guiding force. A decent life is possible for someone who does not know God, does not care about God. But a converted life, a Christ-like life, is only possible by the indwelling power of God. Somebody say amen. amen. This is God's desire for us. And we must open our minds to accept the biblical reality that God requires a sinless life. But how does he do that? Let's go to John 15. It's 339. We have a few minutes. John 15. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, in his image. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now read verse 3 for me. Yeah. Now ye are clean, how? Through the word. Mm -hmm. Come on. Which I have. This is the cleansing agent. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Let's read from verse 25. And as you find it, I ask my Father in heaven one more time to give me the right words as I close, the right spirit, the right attitude. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Do you have Ephesians 5? Yes. Reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Read with me now. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. How? By the word, the word of God is the cleansing agent. Now, someone will say, wait a minute, preacher. I thought it was the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John chapter 6. John 6. Mm -hmm. Same book, 
earlier chapter. John 6, we read verse 63, listen to Jesus Christ. Do we have that? Yes. Read with me. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you. What's that? What did he say? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Any man or woman who receives the word receives the spirit. Because the word is spirit filled. Ask me to explain. I can't. The words that I speak unto you, says Christ, they are spirit and they are life. What life? Eternal life. Why? The, the text begins, it is the spirit that quickeneth. What does quickeneth mean? To bring alive. To bring alive. As verily as Christ raised Lazarus with his word, he raises spiritual Lazaruses with his word. You didn't get it. Tell me what Jesus said when he raised Lazarus. Lazarus, Lazarus come forth. Was that the word of Christ? Yes. What happened to Lazarus? He came forth. That word had life. Where was Jesus? Outside the tomb. Where was Lazarus? In that cave. That word woke up Lazarus. That word had life. Listen to this verse. You know it very well. When Christ comes a second time. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With a voice of the archangel. With a trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Now here's Jesus. Way up in the heaven somewhere. Because when he comes the second time. He does not touch the earth. So if there's anyone running around McDonald telling you. He's Jesus. You turn away. Because when Christ comes the second time. He does not touch the earth. So the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. With a shout. Voice of the archangel. Trump of God, three statements that simply mean he will say something loudly. What's the result? The dead in Christ shall rise first. How did he raise Lazarus? His word. How will he raise the righteous dead? His word. Now, let's look at it spiritually. Go to Ephesians again, this time chapter 5. Ephesians 5, let's read verse 14. As you read 14, keep in mind what Jesus said to the, 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 the corpse of Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. That's what he told Lazarus. Now let's read Ephesians 5, 14. Keep what Jesus said to Lazarus in mind. Wherefore he saith what? Awake, Awake thou that sleepest, come on, and arise from the dead. Is that not what Jesus said to Lazarus in different words? Yes, this time in Ephesians 5, 14, it is spoken to us spiritually. Listen to me carefully. The same power Lazarus come forth had to raise Lazarus awake from the dead has the same power to anyone who accepts it by faith. Amen. To rise spiritually. Amen. And there's a drunkard in the gutter somewhere who needs to hear these words. Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead. And if that man, that woman takes those words in, the same thing that happened to Lazarus physically will happen to that person spiritually because they're spoken by the same power, the power of God. This is the, the, the tool that God uses to bring about purification, the spirit-filled word. When Jesus said to that man, rise, take up thy bed, and walk, he obeyed that word. And he walked. Jesus is saying to somebody, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. And I'm telling you, that is as powerful as Lazarus come for. Perhaps you have a child who needs to read this verse and obey the words of Christ. Arise from the death of your drugs and your alcohol and your gambling, your womanizing. Arise from it. And Christ shall give thee light. And light is life. In him was life. The life was light of men. And the light of the world. He that falleth me shall not walk in darkness. But shall have the light of life. God requires of us. A sinless life. Does it happen overnight? No. Grow in grace. But we must have this in mind. I want to reflect my savior. 
Because they, they may behold your good works. Come on, finish it. And glory, the whole purpose is for the glory of God. Not for you or for me. The whole purpose is for the glory of God. So when Jesus was on that cross, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the passers-by, the soldiers, everyone mocked him. And he took it. Because his focus was not him, it was the glory of his father. And the centurion who was watching when he saw how Jesus conducted himself while he was bleeding and suffering and cursed and spat upon, he said, truly, this was a righteous man. This was the son of God. The final, the, 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 the ultimate purpose of living a victorious life is the glory of God. Not mine. Oh yes, we reap all kinds of benefits. Because the source of all our problems is sin. But ultimately it is the glory, the, the, the ultimate purpose of what Christ did was the glory of God. And so he said in his great prayer, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah 43 verse 7, I have created him for my glory. Living a victorious life brings glory to God. Amen. You and I were allowed to live that through our lives we may bring glory to God. Because there's a power that has consistently given God a bad name and that power is Satan. And every time we sin, we contribute to Satan's agenda. When we allow Christ to work in us, we prove Satan wrong. And so I ask you, as I join you, let us recommit our lives to so live by the power of God that day by day we'll draw closer and closer. Let us not surrender to weaknesses we've had for a long time. Let us not say that's the way I am because Jesus came to die because that's the way you are. But that death and resurrection unleash nuclear power to change us so that we can be something else and the universe can marvel. Everyone who goes through the pearly gates will go through with a sinless character. But a life in heaven begins on earth. Mm -hmm. To live as saints in heaven, we practice living like saints on earth. Amen. Are you with me? You don't wait to get to the Olympics to practice. You practice before you get to the Olympics. And Christ is coming to set up a brand new world. We're told in Revelation 22 verse 3, there shall be no more curse. What brought the curse? Sin. If God allowed one man or woman with one sin, that one sin can start the catastrophe all over again. And the word of God is clear. Iniquity shall not rise the second time. Sin's first occurrence caused so much suffering for God. And he's still suffering right now. That God says this will never, never happen again. And so he hates sin. Hebrews 1 verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. God hates sin, but he loves righteousness. Let's recommit our lives today to say, Father, I recommit my life to you. Work in me to work and to do of your good pleasure. Can I see your right hand? Please work in me. Hands down. Listen to this verse and I pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24 says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I pray, and the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it, but he does it with my constant cooperation. Hmm. Here's bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your simple message. You have a standard for us. 
And that standard is sinlessness through the abiding power of the Spirit of Christ, who is also the Spirit of God. Father, help us to believe this day, God. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Help us to understand that it is more than a decent life that is required, even though a decent life is a good thing. What is required is a life of total victory over sin, and that is only possible by the involvement of divine power. And that power is the very life of Christ in his spirit-filled word. Change the way we think, dear God. Raise our standards. Remind us of these inspiring words. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Let us yearn for that state, dear Father. Not for our sake, but that glory may come to your most deserving name. Hear this humble pray, God. Bless all those who listen, I pray. Let decisions be made for sinlessness, which is the same thing as decisions for Christ. In his name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our promise is all, it stands as the sun. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast till I come.